Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations. What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures? The innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation. What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby takes to the river with Missouri politician and frontier artist George Caleb Bingham, now considered one of the greatest American painters of the 19th century. This episode was filmed before a live audience at the Truman Memorial Building in Independence, Missouri. Now I'd like to introduce to you a man who called Independence home in his best years and who was known as the Missouri artist, George Caleb Bingham. <laughs> Mr. Bingham, a pleasure to see you again. Good to see you. Please, have, have, a, have you. a seat. So it's appropriate that we start today stating the fact that you, who are our greatest painter, uh, had only a modest success in your early career uh, as an itinerant portrait painter. In 1840, you had a budding career as a politician. In, in fact, you were invited to address the very first political convention, the nominating convention, of your political party, which was the Whigs. That's right. Well, the word Whig, actually, comes from Whigamore. And a Whigamore was a Scottish Presbyterian opponent of Charles I in the 17th century. And the idea was someone who resisted royalist tendencies. And this then was applied to many of the Americans during our own revolution. And finally, Henry Clay was defying Andrew Jackson, who was determined to destroy the National Bank. And Clay felt strongly that anyone who wanted to resist the tyrannous element of Andrew Jackson should consider himself a Whig, resisting that kind of imperialist attitude. And so you were, you were a great uh, uh, admirer of, uh, oh, of Henry Clay. Enormously. Uh, Old uh, Hank was a West, great hero. The Western star. Of course, the Whigs didn't last terribly long, and you had to find other... Well, other we were torn apart, of course, by the Civil War and the whole question of slavery. And you had Southern Whigs, like the great Clay, and you had extremist Whigs who were more abolitionist in attitude, and you had people in the middle who were trying to preserve the Union and yet modify our position on slavery. And eventually it pulled the party apart. And those who were interested in abolition, uh, of course, became the Republican Party. But I bring this up because, in fact, your first great commission mm -hmm. uh, as an artist, the first thing you were celebrated for as an artist was because you knew James Sidney Rollins. That's right. Your this good friend who was the first, uh, owned the first newspaper in Columbia, Missouri. You, with him, were one of the organizers of the Whig Party in That's Missouri, right. and they asked you to do something for the first political convention of the Whigs in, right. in, in, eight, in 1840. And he wanted me to build a banner. And I said, what about an enormous box that would be carried by four men and could be then rotated? This is the era of torchlight parades. Oh, absolutely. I mean, how else were you going to draw people in? You had to have every kind of theatrical element you could find. And so an enormous banner was painted on four sides, and this is for William Henry Harrison. We were anxious to promote the whole idea of a strong federal government, national bank, and development of the industrial elements in the nation and to improve canals, waterways, railroads. On the banner it said commerce, agriculture, and the arts. And the arts. Ah, in the arts. union we cherish them. That's the right. union. 1840, William Henry Harrison is elected president. That's right. The shortest term of office. Mm -hmm. uh, the poor him. man passed away suddenly within 30 but days. I had followed him there to Washington in hopes of gaining greater influence. This was in it. Oh, and they also, the Whigs took both uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So I thought, well, what better place to develop my own career than to go to Washington? And I had a studio in the Capitol at that time. That was possible. Now, now think you, you were actually painting in the Capitol, mm -hmm. and sometimes you were painting in a little tent outside of the, mm -hmm. the Capitol. Mm -hmm. At one point, John Quincy Adams, Indeed. former president of the United States, son of a president of the United States, uh, was walking by. He and came, you remember? He came into the studio, and he was very quiet. He stood there watching me work. And he finally said, did you know that there was a woman in the Bible who painted? And I shouldn't have been quite so sharp-tongued, and I said, yes, but I think Jezebel was painting somewhat differently than I was. 
Well, he liked the fact that I could immediately identify who he meant, and so he would quiz me on, on biblical matters. He was quite an amateur biblical scholar, as I suppose was I. And we struck off an uh, acquaintance and something of a friendship, and I encouraged him to come and sit, and indeed he did. I painted him twice. You got, you got to, to paint John Quincy Adams. You painted Daniel Webster, yep. David Rice Atchison, Atchison, senator from Missouri, leader of the pro-slavery Democrats. Tell us a little bit about your background, because it's a little bit like Henry Clay in that you grew up on the land. And I grew up in, in Virginia. Virginia. I was in Augusta County, and my father and grandfather were both farmers, and they were slave owners. And then father, unfortunately, had backed a loan for someone, and it defaulted, and father decided that it would be best to travel west. Banking business is oh, a very difficult it was business. a very so different time. Crash. So we gathered up six children, and my mother and father and my grandfather, and we had seven slaves as well. And we journeyed all the way to what was in Franklin, Missouri, on, on the river. Eventually, Franklin was washed away and became New Franklin, and we had to move to Arrow Rock across the river. My father, unfortunately, died when I was only 12 years old. He died of malaria. In, uh, my mother then ran a little farm, and she also had a girls' school on which I was, received some rough uh, education. And there was even an arts teacher uh, who encouraged me in my well, scribbles. And how, how did you learn to paint? There, there are many myths about this. I was uh, essentially uh, self-taught. I had no ultimate master. But there was an interesting event, as you mentioned, Just the myth. The story that Gilbert Stewart came oh, no, through. No, 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 he never came through. But in 1820, we did have Chester Harding, who came through Booneville. And he had been over towards uh, St. Charles painting Daniel Boone, who was on his last legs about to expire. Uh, he had taken a room in Franklin, my father's Square and Compass Tavern. And father sent me upstairs to watch this man, a professional artist. We didn't see many of those. And he said, you might learn something. Just watch him, help him, hold his paints, whatever he needs. And I was fascinated to see this man take brushes, paint. A face was coming alive in front of me. I didn't see anything quite like it. You know, you've seen barn painters and even sign painters. But to see a face come alive on canvas was an extraordinary experience. And it sort of put the fire in me. And I remember that. I used to prick my finger until I got a little blood and mix it with some rust and some, and some charcoal. And I would work on the barn. And father hated it because he liked his barns clean. And mother would say, oh, just leave it. The barn will fall down eventually. But look what he's doing. <laughs> the thing that made your reputation, the fur traders, uh, descending the Missouri. It has some relationship to our friend over here, the beaver. Uh, <laughs> it's the 1840s. 45. 1845. Yeah. And it's really the end of the fur trade. It's, describe this painting to us, the fur traders descending the Missouri. It's interesting because it was so early in my career. Uh, I had a model, and I placed him in a canoe and, and sketched him sitting there. And he had a son. He was a half-breed. And so I depicted him on top of a, a box, and he had a little duck that he'd killed, and he had a, a bag of wampum by him. I, I was so pleased because I hadn't done an awful lot to catch the sense of humidity hanging over the river. And you had a feeling of cultures meeting, future about to happen, past coming and going, the fur trade disappearing, we're going to be overwhelmed with industry, Ships will be charging up the river, assuming we ever get them cleared of uh, snags, snags and poke stalks and so forth. And it, was, it just caught people's imagination. And, and, I'm glad it did. And, which brings up your other great painting of this, this period, this two-year period where you become famous nationally, uh, which is The Concealed Enemy, mm -hmm. the, the portrait of a, the Osage Indian, the Osage Indian mm -hmm. behind rocks, right. waiting for his enemy whoever they were. We weren't plagued by Indians in Arrow Rock, particularly those that remained were very friendly on whole. I was really trying to capture a sense of the period, as, as Mr. Kemper says, before, say in the 1820s, when there was a sense of greater danger and mystery and what was happening. Where were those people going to go? What was going to happen to them? How were they going to make a living if the buffalo were all cleared away? How would they survive if their culture was decimated? We didn't know, but it was interesting that that little painting sort of caught a little bit of that feeling of mystery, loss, anxiety. And, and you were recognized in New, in New York, in Philadelphia, almost immediately in the 1840s when these paintings were bought by the American Art Union as a classic American artist, as, as describing classic American well, uh, scenes. I caught the zeitgeist that was a genre painting. And remember, we're, we're coming out of the, sort of the Biedermeyer period in Europe, and there was this interest in how did people live as opposed to great monumental portraits of, 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 of Washington, you know, crossing the Delaware like Leutze and my rather inept attempt at the same idea. Sounds mm -hmm. like I hate to take you back to politics, ah. but, in, but in fact, 
politics was always central to your life as well, and perhaps the, the, that your, your understanding of the, of the people and the way they live comes, uh, because you're out, out among them campaigning. In fact, mm -hmm. you ran for the state legislature in 1846 uh, against uh, Erasmus Darwin Sappington. Sappington. You win the election by three votes, mm -hmm. or so yes. it would oh, seem. It was three votes, and I was assured uh, of my position through committee. And by the state constitution, that was legal. I was prepared to take my seat. Sappington insisted that there was a miscount, and he refused to allow it. And we went through numerous votes over this business. Sappington insisted that it be voted on by the entire General Assembly, knowing fully well that the Democrats held the majority. And so I was, uh, I lost that, and I had to return home, disgusted with the whole political system. You in indirectly, uh, one of your great paintings, one of your first great paintings uh, of the river, uh, in, in fact, brings you in a way back to politics. There's a there's a great painting, the lighter relieving a steamboat. Mm -hmm. A ground, mm -hmm. uh, and it's and it's a group of men on a, a raft, a raft. Uh, in the Missouri That's River. Right. Whether you wanted to see that as a metaphor for where we were going politically, or whether it was merely a statement of the fact that we were not maintaining our waterways properly, and so our ships were running aground, it worked on a number of levels, and it also had an interesting well, atmosphere. So as well. you're talking about a painting that that has achieved great fame, huh? and in fact hangs today in the White House. At this very moment, 1847 we're talking about, mm -hmm. you're, you're disgusted with the 1846 election, but you're looking forward perhaps to the 1848 election, mm -hmm. which is going to be about rivers and harbors, among That's other right. things, and about That's these right. snags and sandbars and what the government can do about it. The painting is, is actually bought by James Yateman, who was the leading banker in St. Louis, the leading member of the Whig Party in St. Louis. He bought your painting and sent it, uh, sent it around to be displayed mm -hmm. uh, while he went off to the Rivers and Harbors Convention uh, in Chicago where they protested Polk's latest right. veto of the River, Rivers and Harbors Bill. So really this was a political statement. Action. Of course it was. As well. And in 1848, what happened? Well, I, I ran again against our dear friend Erasmus Darwin Sappington. This time I won without contestation by over 30 votes. And I took my seat in the House of Representatives in Jefferson City. But it was a terrible time for me because my beloved Elizabeth had passed away a mere month before I took my seat. Uh, she had been pregnant with a little boy who also died, and she had tuberculosis. We knew she was failing for quite a while. And uh, we brought her back to Arrow Rock. And I thought, I can't, I can't continue with this po politics business. I suppose I was prone to the black moods at the time, not surprising. And this one, again, my beloved Major Rollins. Where would I have been without that man? Put his arm around me, as he did so many times in so many other crises for me, and said, George, what would Elizabeth have wanted you to do? She'd have wanted you to do your duty. Go to Jeff City and work. So I did. So you, 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 you entered the legislature. And in fact, in, in 1849 and 1850, we have the Compromise of 1850, the Wilmot Proviso, the, mm -hmm. uh, the beginning of, of the end of, of the, the Union through the, uh, the rise of slavery as, a, as an issue. They won't know or remember, but the Wilmot Proviso was the idea that uh, Congress was going to be able to determine what territories were going to be slave or free, preferably free, is what the Wilmot Proviso wanted. And Claiborne Fox Jackson, he was determined that uh, Missouri was not going to support this proviso. He wanted to be sure that people could, if they wanted to be slavery, th this was something that they would choose alone. Well, he uh, sent out what was called the Fox Resolution to that effect, meaning that our representatives in Washington were to vote that way. I happened as a freshman a representative, quite extraordinary, was made chairman of the uh, Federal Relations Committee, which usually didn't do much. But this being a particularly intense time in our nation's history, people were anxious to see how we were going to respond to this pro or con slavery issue. And we proposed a somewhat uh, a compromise, suggesting that Congress should have the right to make the decision one way or the other with the territories, but they must choose wisely and depending upon the area and how people were feeling. Well, we lost that one too. Fox Jackson was able to overthrow that, and Missouri went firmly pro-slavery at that point. So you lost the vote uh, yes. on the Wilmot Proviso, and, and you weren't re-elected to, uh, to the, to the State House. No. But then you begin to paint this famous series, besides your river pictures, this other great series of pictures. Uh, the stump orator, stump mm -hmm. speaking, uh, the county canvas, the, the county election, and the yep. verdict of the people. These great paintings about American uh, elections. 
Now, is this really your experience in Absolutely. politics? Remember, people could sit for three hours listening to a sermon. A good debate was thrilling back then. That was a major form of entertainment. And those of us who were speaking knew it. We were held to a very high level of eloquence. I wasn't drawing or painting satire. I was trying to capture the mood and feeling of what I saw. It wasn't absolute photographic realism. People said, oh, well, in the county election, that must be Arrowrock. That must be um, Miles Marmaduke. That must be so-and-so. That's a friend. That's why that must be uh, Mr. Potter's dog. Well, but then an the, artist and, gathers and in the his elements in the from the county election, you take, you take a step in, in, in terms of realism. The very first campaign you're involved in, the 1840 campaign, mm -hmm. is sometimes called There's the Log Cabin and right. Hard Cider campaign. And Hard Cider, uh, as we know, does have an effect on elections. And, <laughs> and in fact, Hard Cider seems to be represented pretty liberally in all of these, all of these paintings as a stimulant of mm -hmm. uh, electoral reflection. Absolutely. Yeah. They're trying to get people loosened up. And if you offer them a drink, maybe they'll vote for your way. Well, in, we, in the county election, election was, there's actually a yes. man being dragged He's into drunk. the polls. And he was going to and, vote. And then, you had to vote verbally, too, so everybody knew who you were voting for. And you have a, a certain, there's a certain, if not cynicism, skepticism, skepticism at this point in the county election. Because, after all, I'd seen how it could fail. Goodness me, I was overthrown from a vote. I thought I had won by three votes. So I wanted the feeling of, look, this is the will of the people. This is a democracy in action. This was wonderful. At the same time, people are human beings. They're corruptible, they're fallible, they're weak. Then, and then you've got the verdict of the people, which is the, the painting you, you made of the announcement uh, of the winner of an election. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's in some ways the most interesting because, the, again, a huge crowd scene and every single one of them, with one or two exceptions, is completely ignoring the announcement. And I think that draws the idea of what's happened. Is the nation making the right choice? Even though the will of the people is everything, can people be trusted? We simply raise the question. That's all you have to do so that people think as opposed to voting on impulse. Uh, uh, 1859, 1860 comes along, and you've been trying to get a commission from the state of Missouri or from the national government for a long time, and you finally get a, uh, a commission uh, to deliver the, the portraits of... Washington and Jefferson. Washington and Jefferson. To stand in the Jefferson City, at, at, uh, in the capital down there. And it's interesting, the government was as uninterested in supporting the arts as perhaps they are now, I don't know. Uh, but finally, I was given $3,500. Which was a lot of money. It was a days. lot of so money. They, at this the time. was a significant And it allowed commission. us to go to Europe. I'd never been to Europe. I was anxious to go. It's 1861. You finish these paintings of Washington and Jefferson. On January 3rd, your, your mortal enemy, Claiborne Fox Jackson, who is now governor, governor of the state of Missouri, on January 3rd, 1861, he delivers a speech advocating, in essence, secession, secession. for the state of Missouri. Five days later, on the anniversary, of the Battle of, of New, New Orleans. Orleans, you deliver the paintings, and they ask you to give a, a, a speech, a which they, I think, speech. assume would probably be uh, about, about the Washington works and, about and Jefferson. The men. And we were on the very bridge, of course, of the, falling into the abyss of civil war. And I thought, you know, anyone who wants to support that, that's disaster and, and chaos for the nation. It's practically treasonous. And I, what would these men have said? And so, of course, I spoke passionately in favor of the Union and what we were trying to accomplish. And many of those men were very anxious to secede. And uh, I was taken to task for having mixed politics with art and once in again. Fact, they tried to, to rusticate you. But in fact, uh, very shortly thereafter, Claiborne Fox Jackson had to uh, head to Arkansas very under, rapidly. The, uh, under the, uh, <laughs> the attacks of the Union Army under Nathaniel Lyon, Lyon. Whose, whose portrait you eventually painted. But your civil war was interesting because you, you immediately... I, I enlisted as a private. Mind you, I was 50 years old, and Rollins said, you silly fool, what do you think you're doing? And I said, I'm going to do my duty. Well, he saw to it that I was quickly voted as a, a captain in Colonel Van Horn's Kansas City Company C Battalion. We were essentially a, a, a support group. So when Governor Pro Tem Hamilton Gamble, who had been brought in to replace Claiborne Jackson, uh, asked me to be Secretary of Treasurer. Initially, I thought, well, good Lord, find a banker. <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> he said, no, 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 I want a man who's going to tell me the truth, who's going to hold them to the line. 
Now, your career after the war was, was also substantial in politics. You became uh, a commissioner, the president of the, of the, of the police commission in Kansas mm -hmm. City. Briefly, I was you, not popular thing to do to close down the gambling houses and make the taverns close on Sunday. And then you're also, you become adjutant general, in which mm -hmm. you're responsible for, for getting reparations, reparations for the state of Missouri from everything that happened. For the so hundreds the and hundreds of people you're, who had suffered in the problems of the war, and the government was anything but anxious to repay anybody. You're, you're asked to run for Congress, to run for governor. governor. You're, you're, you're known uh, throughout the state and, and, and seen as an honest man, partly because of this concern for, uh, uh, for, for the law. Tell us about order number 11. What is the what, what, what are the series of events that get to order number 11? I will try not to run off the rails on this. This is a subject of which I get very heated and passionate. But in August 13th, 1863, there was a house on Grand Street, downtown Kansas City, 1425. My father-in-law, uh, Mr. Thomason, I had purchased this, and I used that as a, as a studio. I built a little extension on the top. It wasn't a large house at all. When I became treasurer, we moved the family out to Jefferson City, naturally. Brigadier General Ewing uh, requisitioned that house and many others, the, of course. The brother-in-law of General, General Sherman, Sherman, by the way. And he decided that there were a number of women. Some uh, They were all thought to have been supporting Quantrill and his, his men who had been raiding, of course. of course. And we had, of course, federal troops under Jennison and James Lane, who'd also been doing a, a reprehensible thing. Who were coming things, in from Kansas, Kansas which, and uh, raiding into Missouri. Under the guise of being federal soldiers. At, oh, Harrisonville and... Monstrous. Anyway, there were these 11 women in this house. Three of them were related to Bloody Bill Anderson, and the house collapses and kills five of them, hurts all of them. I come hurrying up to Kansas City to find out what's gone on. Ewing says, well, the soldiers felt that the women were trying to dig their way out. I said, nonsense. Someone told me the soldiers had been moving the support beams so that the basic structure of the house was called into question, and that's what caused it to collapse. Well, now, I'm sure many of you know that the 21st of August of that year was the bloody attack on Lawrence and Quantrill and his men, who had been planning this anyway. Quantrill and his men, including Bloody Bill David Anderson, Anderson, whose sister and, and, and mother Over 400 of them. Um, this, this was the spur. This, they felt, was the great justification. And they attacked Lawrence and killed 150 people and burned, I don't know how many, buildings and over $2 million worth of damage. It was an appalling thing. General Brigadier Ewing's answer to this, let us solve the problem by wiping out all possible supporters of these men on the border. And so he published on uh, August 25th his appalling order number 11, in which all families had to leave within a mile of a military bases in the counties of Jackson and Cass and Bates and half of Vernon. And hundreds of families were forced to leave. And since most of them were farming people, they were forced to leave their, their, their crops. This was August. Hay was so left in the field. Wheat was Corn left in the barns, the things field. that hadn't been put away. And if they couldn't be delivered to the military station, they were burnt. And the houses were burnt. And by heaven, you could look out, you could see the smoke rising from independence. I saw these women and children and old men with broken down carts and horses that were superannuated struggling to get to the river to be taken across to get out of the order. It was the most monstrous thing I'd ever seen. And, and if it wasn't a prime example. You confronted I, General Ewing. And, I did. And, you, and, and I and, said and, to him, sir, I will make you infamous by pen and brush if it is within my means to do so. He laughed. He said, this is war, Mr. Bingham. Don't you understand? I have to do what I see fit. I said, annihilating the public rights of these people is fit? For two years, you had to continue as state treasurer yes. and, do your, and do your work, so you, couldn't, you, you didn't have time to paint. But as soon as the war was over... And we moved here to Independence. And, and you came to Independence, and here in Independence, you, you painted the great uh, Order Number 11 painting, uh, which shows uh, the, the depredations of military authority that, that impoverishes and oppresses, as you said. Exactly. Something that you also put in the engraving of order number 11 when it was engraved dedicated to the friends of civil, civil liberty. liberty civil liberty without which what are we are we merely a headless mass blindly stumbling being told what to think and do subject to every whim of the government or of military forces no it's the will of the people 
It's you. It's every head, every head that got painted. Life, thought, passion, soul. That's what we are. That's why we live. To express our need for each other and to function. That's why. The, the, the last official position you held was the first professor of art yes. uh, at the University, University of Missouri. Missouri, which James Sidney Rollins uh, was responsible for, uh, for doing it. Rollins was one of the, the founders of the University of Missouri and, and eventually a president of the University of Missouri. He delivered my first lecture. I was too ill at the time. I, couldn't, I was having struggle with pneumonia. I had written it, and he kindly spoke it for me, which was very kind. In, in that lecture, you, you said... Uh, the, the line that, uh, that I think is most poignant is, is that artists permit themselves to be absorbed only by what they love. Mm -hmm. You loved your country, you loved your state. In your own time, you were known as the Missouri artist for what you painted of the rivers and the landscape and the people, the elections. You're known as the American artist, I think, for those things as well as your own dedication to civil liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, George Caleb Bingham. I think George Caleb Bingham is never going to be forgotten in the United States because of not just his electoral series, but the river paintings as well, you know, the trappers down the, Missis the Missouri, uh, that sense of what was America like, where did it come from, and where are we going, and the dream of democracy, and the fact that people lose that dream, and that's a tragedy. He could see it happening even in his own time, and I think his attempt to capture that on oil and canvas was a way to try to uh, maintain it and keep people stimulated about it, to talk about it, believe in it. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations. <laughs>